It's mic'd up with Mikey Matuk. Got the boys in. I got Lloyd. We got J Mitch. We got Jackie Boy. He tried to jump up and he might have knocked it in. It Good time. Let's go. What a start to the Monday. Oh, no. I'm a liar. <laughs> I mean, I'm from Lafayette. My boys would come in and say, <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So I'm, me and Joe on the ground, I got Joe in the headlock. And he's sitting there, <laughs> Helmet. He's, he's punching me in the stomach, like steady punching me, punching me, punching me. Here, and he's, this everyone's sitting around, who here thinks Ochinko can practice today after having five full beers? And he goes, Chad Jones, right? Chad's doing the team. <laughs> Six for, minutes. For seven minutes, right? <laughs> Chad's like, no, nah, man, I, I don't think Ochinko can practice today. And I was like, I look back, I'm like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I fucking saw you there. You were more fucked up than me. Be on the spirit plane had some issues i think she was sleep sleep farting you heard her or you just thought it was her i, I sat right next to her so. whoa what was that how to the show <laughs> 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 well i want to wow. have that oh, but... God, you you had a circus or something <laughs> <laughs> like, i'm late like i don't even know what i'd be doing <laughs> <laughs> now, when you do go to spring training, are you going to bring your chinchilla and your turtle? <laughs> My dad tell you about it. The SEC is, God, they hate fat people. <laughs> I mean, I get crushed for that. You know what I mean? And it's like, come on, man. Hey, it's, it's, it's just the South, bro. You got a bunch of food down here. Yeah, like, they, they they're just, all they're fatter just than them. <laughs> Players, look at... Lloyd. <laughs> you know what, Lloyd? <laughs> I mean, you're looking for a recruiting coordinator, but... Coach. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'll piss my pants right now. No way. We're wearing, <laughs> no way. We're wearing <laughs> gray pants, long gray pants. He goes, I'll piss my pants right now. Welcome back to Mic'd Up. Today's Monday, February 6th. I hope everybody had a great weekend. I know I did. I am exhausted. I am on going on week eight in a row of Family's wedding season. Big. It is wedding season and um, it doesn't stop. The end, is, the end is near. Actually, there's a break. Uh, my wife's, all of her friends are getting married. I went through the gauntlet before. I'm going through the gauntlet again. That's just the way it works. Uh, but... I am here. We had a great weekend. Um, had to go to New Orleans. Had to come back from New Orleans. Had to do a lot of different things. But we got a great show for you. Coach Jay Johnson. Jay Johnson, Monday start today. Coach Jay Johnson is coming on the show in 13 minutes at 6.15 to talk everything LSU baseball. Um, there's 11 days until the baseball season starts. So well, this, that's there's a lot of answers. There's probably still some questions and some some unknowns but there's probably a lot more answers now than we had the last time we spoke with him he's going to come on the show via video call we can get all the answers if you have questions please come in get in the chat ask him in the chat if we have time to get to him we will we will try our best to ask all the questions that you want us well, we to have ask the, we have the new feature where i can show him on the screen we do so have the new feature where we this. can there we go and the weddings are your fault that's what you get for being a cradle robber Ooh, that's i mean uh, <laughs> I got nothing to that. You know, she's younger than me. That That's works. A good thing. She looks way better than me. She's younger than me. That is tough. I for did you that. Too. I did. I don't think so. But she's just so little. And what? You're so big. What is happening? I mean, okay, we're gonna go through the Heineken <laughs> headlines right now, right? As I mentioned, Jay Johnson what? is live. I, I'm not. Even, I'm she just does. gonna. She's like got abs. I'm, I'm just huh? gonna ignore what he just said there. Jay Johnson is live. <laughs> Preview the LSU baseball season at 6:15. Saints. Hired a new defensive coordinator in Joe Woods. We will get into that. Nick Underhill is coming on the show at 7 o'clock. Nick Underhill is the founder of NewOrleans.Football. He has all the answers. We talked to Mike Triplett. I believe it was two weeks ago. Whenever all my friends were gone, it was just me. So me and Mike Triplett had a conversation about what the Saints are going to do. Uh, this was before the Sean Payton trade. This was, you know, a lot of 
things were up in the air. Now you have a defensive coordinator. The defensive coordinator comes from Cleveland, who just got fired from Cleveland. So we will ask Nick Hunter Underhill what he thinks about that and what the Saints faithful thinks about that. Sean Payton is now poaching everybody from the Saints, which we thought they were going to do. No lateral moves, but he got uh, Zach Streif is now the offensive line coach for Denver. He was not coaching for the Saints. He was in the booth, but he is now going to the coaching role. He is there. Are rumors that he's about to, they're about to take a tight ends coach or bring a coach over who was an offensive assistant to be the tight ends coach there in Denver. Uh, he also told Russell Wilson, hey, Tim, Team 3, see ya. We ain't doing that shit under my watch. <laughs> you're going to get out there. There's going to be no more, hey, you're going to have to talk to my manager to talk to you. Your phone, everybody should have your number. I don't know if he told him that. I would imagine if Team 3's out, the whole, hey, you got to go through somebody to get to me, the whole gatekeeper thing, that's got to be out too. Uh, LSU wins basketball. Still undefeated. One of two undefeated teams left the other undefeated team is south carolina who's number one in the country for some reason they decided to keep lsu at number three right uh indiana is number two lsu mm. plays south carolina at south carolina one o'clock on super bowl sunday that is going to be a, a, a so it's been sold out for weeks they say um that is going to be a, a big time matchup and it's something that you can watch right before the super bowl starts it is super bowl super bowl week Scottsdale is going is going to have a, uh, a lot of if you want to go and have bodies. if you want to have a good time right now I would I would suggest just going over to Scottsdale and just say I'm just going to take off the whole week of work just ride up and down Camp well, not Camelback right up and down North Scottsdale Road North Scottsdale Road yeah, yeah. you go there you have the waste management which is on the bucket list I want to go see the waste manager I heard it's amazing but you also have the Super Bowl that weekend in Glendale yeah. which is 25 minutes from Scottsdale. Just say everything, Scott. Within thirty minute, minute, thirty minute radius, Scottsdale. Big weekend, Super Bowl weekend. We're gonna get into the Super Bowl conversation probably a little bit on Wednesday and Friday because you know we have a long time. You're gonna get all of that on the national media. We're gonna tell you some of our gambling stuff that we want to do. We're gonna do some of the um, some of the uh, props that I think is interesting that we're gonna get into. We're all gonna have our picks. We're gonna do a better job in 2023 of giving you the gambling content that everybody wants or does not want, but they're going to get anyway because we want to give it to you. Um, SEC baseball came out. I want to ask Jay about this too. They're implementing a 10-run rule in SEC play. If you're up or down by 10 runs after the seventh inning, kaput. you're out. You're done. I have no issue with that. We'll get into it. A little um, issue. I think you brought up a good point pre show. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but I mean, that's the only thing that's going to happen. We'll get into it. Um, but you know, it's. I think that that's, you're not going to see many of those games in the SEC. Rate of play, rate of play. What? You see, what is it? I love you, man. Rate of play, rate of play. When they're playing golf, and he takes one to the, he takes a golf ball to the shin. I don't. I've seen. I love they're you. Trying man. to speed up the game. I've, I, I know what that means. Pace of play. Pace of play. Rate of play. Rate of play. Rate of play. But. I think, that, I think the 10 run rule is, is a good thing for us, SEC baseball. You're not going to see a lot of it. I think it just keeps the game going. SEC baseball over the last couple of years have been, the games have been extremely long. And I know that's been one of the emphasis of baseball is to shorten them up. And are, you this taking is shots at our, are you taking shots at our head coach right now? Or no? no, no, no. It's SEC in a hole. <laughs> SEC baseball in a hole. I'll never take shots at our coach. He's uh, the field general. He's, he's ready to go. You know, and there's a lot of conversation. There's a lot of questions that I want to ask him about. This team, I was I was able to walk around Saturday around the stadium during the scrimmage to see a little bit of that. I was giving a tour of Alex Box Stadium, believe it or not. That is not on the job description, but I did it out of the kindness of my heart. You guys it are went, renaissance, man. It, it went all. very well. It went very well. Explained the history of LSU. I explained. Did you bring him in the happening. elevator? Uh, no, the elevator. It's in the football stadium. Oh, that's where Which you they, are. They, they took the tour already, so I'm sure they saw that, you know. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. But I took him through the Hall of Fame room. I took him up in the press box. I took him to see the suites. I took him into the, you know, it was good. We didn't go into the clubhouse, obviously, because there was a scrimmage going on and guys were walking in and out, and that's off limits because, you know why. I mean, I don't have to explain why that would be off limits. Um, but the guys looked really good. The, the scrimmage was very well run. It was absolutely packed. Like, packed that whole front parking lot when you come off of nicholson full you had people watching the game the weather was beautiful it wasn't super cold just light jacket 
Um, and guys were throwing absolute noise. I, I walked through there when I was giving said tour, and I peeked at the radar gun five or six pitches. You know, it was a 95, a 95, a 94, 96. I'm like, boy, this is... And they're like, Was it interrupting it your tour? Like, could you hear it on the tour while it was, you know, ball to mitt? I could hear it. Swap! Yeah. The whole time. It was nice. It was nice. And, I, you know, I was, we went through the whole thing. But that was... Part of my weekend, I'm excited to have a conversation with Jay. How was y'all's weekend? You know, you went back to A-Town. A-Town, Mardi Gras Ball. Shout out Gradia. We just did the damn thing. I mean, lost the car. That's okay. How do you lose a car? Well, we parked there and stayed in a hotel. Mm-hmm. Then the next morning, I was like, I have no idea where we were. Oh, you did the whole thing. college thing. So I was wow. tried to, well, you did it too. Don't no, look no, at me. No, no, no. You got your car stolen. Yeah, that's different. But I said, yeah. what? That definitely didn't do that. <laughs> that's different. When you get your car stolen, it's different than losing the car. Losing you did and the whole, stolen is a little uh, different. I will say this. I have lost my car in the parking lot at LSU when I was younger, like when I was a freshman. When I, was a, when I first got to LSU, I parked. And I'm like, man, where the How old were you then? Not 30. <laughs> I admit I, I didn't. I didn't have to say it. He just said it himself. Well, so. here's the deal. I was. Uh, I mean, I'm not very good with directions. Me or, either. We know, know this so, about yeah, each other. So I, I'd imagine that if you know, listen, when I go in the airport, I make sure I take a picture of the post of where my car is parked because I'll forget. Don't. I do the yep. same thing. That's yeah. And that's what happened to me. Is so that's I, taking responsibility in my. I know my, my weaknesses. Yes, exactly. Yes. I'm and, self-aware of what I'm not good at, and that is it. And the funny thing was, we found it after the ball to go get like all of our like clothes or whatever for the hotel, and we're like, oh, no problem. We'll find it in the morning. The next morning, no shot. We walked around the parking lot for an hour. So you wore a tux. This? Yes, I so, did. I was walking around in tuxedo pants. Well, let, me, and, let me ask a question. So, as a tux guy, and I think I know the answer to this. Are you a cummerbund? You a vest guy? Or are you a suspenders guy? I went none. I go gold chain, bow tie. I think the cummerbund's out. I don't think you have to do that anymore. And I had, and I wore like a brooch. There's no was, shot in hell Lloyd would wear a cummerbund if he doesn't have to. No. Yeah, I'm a, I like no a vest. shot. I did enjoy the. I suspenders did enjoy the nice suspenders. Touch. Yes, I did enjoy the suspenders. Yeah. I like. You know, that I like, might be my next move. I like the suspenders rolled up sleeves, tie undone, and then that's why you still yeah, had like, yeah, oh, it looks yeah. good, but like you're kind of yeah, loose. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? I like that. How was your weekend, Jay? It's good. I thought about going into scrimmage on Saturday, and then I. You realized, got on the couch and realized I don't want to. Well, move. no, then I realized I was like, it's probably going to be packed, and you just told me before it was, so I'm kind of glad I didn't. Because I kind of wanted to just like. I just wanted to be like a spectator in the sense of I, like I don't really care about all the other people. Right. I just wanted it to be like a no one's here. Let me see how this thing goes. And then I was like, man, it might be kind of packed. I'm gonna just chill anyway. Yeah, it was it was, it was nice. It was. I did show up to the the dog parade downtown. There was a dog parade. Yeah. Like did a, you bring uh, like Luka? a Mardi Gras? No, because I didn't know what was going on. So there's a Mardi Gras dog parade. Is it not, just, I thought it was Spanish Town. Nope. Mm, well, that's all Mardi Gras. That's yeah. That's actual Mardi Gras parade. They, I it's guess apparently they do a dog parade too, which was so there was a eighteen million dogs downtown, wow. just absolute zoo. Bunch of poop. Uh, not as much as I thought I was gonna see. Really? Yeah, it wasn't that bad. Huh. Not as much barking as you thought you'd see. Like uh-huh. they were like very. Good dogs. I think there was so much going on that They're dogs were just wrong. like yeah, 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 just wide eyed and just looking everywhere. Yeah, but it was cool though. There was a lot of people down there. That's good. Yeah, That's you good. should you should look into doing that with I'm Kobe. Glad, this year. I'm gonna have to try to do that, Kobe. Uh... He would like we'll, that. We'll see. Yeah, like that. I don't know if he's ready for that. He likes a lot. Of, he likes. Yeah, so I'm giving you a year, a year in, a year in advance. Yeah, we'll so work. We'll train. We'll, we'll work on it. Um, I can tell you what, though. I am very look, much looking forward to whenever this happens of like just calming down on a weekend and really not leaving the house ever. But you know, that's just the way it is. It's I don't know if that, you have that day. It's in the you. life that we live. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you know, we'll go there. Um, Alabama. What are, you, what are you laughing at me for? Vance trying to retire already. You're just yeah. looking forward to retirement, yeah. The weekend is not a retirement. And then it gets, it gets done with baseball, and he's like, oh, these, these real work hours suck. No, I, I, enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy the work hours. I don't mind the work hours during the week. It's the weekend that you're supposed to regroup, and I have not been able to do that. That's just – I have look. Summer's about to start. I think things are going to slow down. Jesus, you're, you're a little ahead of your skis right here now. Uh, I'm saying you gotta, you gotta I got to get through spring before listen, we get to summer. I got, shit, I got shit. I got shit. Line. I don't think this. I don't think Louisiana has a spring season. I think it just goes straight to summer. Uh, but saving the in the groundhog saw a shadow. So yeah, know. always. I feel like you always. I think it's. A, I think it's a. That's just a scam. It's the same one. Yeah, the. T- I don't even know the name. I can't pronounce the name of the place that they do it from. But no, is it the same groundhog? How long? Yeah, they yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah, until the guy dies. They just get a new one, put them in that. Sure. 
So they just like feed him like a like a pet every year, or they just hope that that's it. Hope he pops back out. Is that him in the ground? Hope he pops back out. I remember him having that stomach like that. Just waiting, like Dan. Did he die? You have to go look in there. Put a little more weight on this year. I haven't seen him in a year. Um, (laughs) Saban, Saban hired Phil. Yeah, that's that. That guy, that one. Saban hired his offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. Pucks to money fills? No, I was just I was gonna say that before you said the name, but what's his name? Pucks <laughs> to what? Pucks Su Tawani. Phil. Okay. P U N X U S X S U T A W N E Y. Phil. I think people are confused why well, you have the sticker on your head. Well, that's gonna be brought to you by FCO. There you go. Every Who's FCO? FCO. Development. development. There we go. FCO yeah. Development is a civil construction company based out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, they they are they specialize in math. Mul- we've bye bye to me long ago, so huh? I never had a chance to work there. Like math, what you know, engineering and all of that such. So, you know, the smarter people. That well, have- this is so civil engineering. Let me explain to you how this works. So civil engineering is more about the earthwork and the ground, and you prep the land before you build vertically. And I don't know how much uh, mathematics that they are actually doing. Maybe Jay can tell in us. that in that spot. So I don't think the math excuse to you is a, is a thing, but. FCO Development, our friends, that's why you had the sticker on your forehead. I, I'm sure your friend, Tyler Lede, uh, appreciates that. I have Tyler's number. I will announce that number later on whenever we give them another plug. But before we get there, Jay is here. Yep, head baseball coach wow. of the LSU Fighting Tigers, number one team in the country. Punctual. Jay Johnson in the on deck circle. We're going to take a 30 second break, get him set up, oh. and then we're going to come back. You're watching Mic'd Up. We'll be back with you in 30 seconds. Today's show is brought to you by Dos Equis. Here in Louisiana, we like to have a great time. If you're looking to be the life of the tailgate, check out Dos Equis mini kegs. Hold 16 beers, easy to tap, easy to pour, easy to chill. Check it out. Become a life of the party. You're welcome. Our What's for Lunch segment is brought to you by Doe's Eat Place. Maybe the best burger in town. If you're not looking for lunch, you're looking for dinner, go check out Doe's Eat Place. They have unbelievable choice of meats. They have unbelievable tamales. They have a great atmosphere. How's it going? Lives. If you're looking for a homey Louisiana type of atmosphere, but you're looking for high quality food, Doe's Eat Place is your spot. Awesome. Go in the back bar, sit at the bar, have a Thank couple you. drinks, watch some games, enjoy the atmosphere, enjoy the vibes. Check out Doe's Eat Place. Coffee. The best place in Baton Rouge to get your meats. Welcome back to Mike'd Up. Uh, as I mentioned before the break, we have head baseball coach Jay Johnson on the show right now talking about LSU baseball. LSU baseball is 11 days away. Coach, I appreciate you coming on. I know your time is very valuable. This is a Jay Johnson Mondays. I appreciate you allowing us to use your knowledge of LSU baseball for our show. So welcome. You got it. Good to see you guys. Good to see you too. Um, Coach, let's get right into it. Season, like I mentioned, is 11 days away. You know, obviously, you have a plan. You go from the fall to to Christmas break to the spring, and now you're, you know, a week and a half away from opening day. Um, What have you seen in the scrimmages leading up to next weekend, right? Because obviously, you have the fall, and everybody's trying to get their, you know, they understand they have a long ways for the season, but now. It's, it's, it's go time, right? You have next weekend is, is opening weekend. So what have you seen uh, in the scrimmages leading up to that weekend? Yeah, I think the work ethic of the players has been good. Uh, the focus level's good. You know, we try to manage their time well with practice and, and manage their focus. And I got to give them high marks on that. Um, I think uh, talent obviously is good across the board. Uh, I really like what I see out of the pitching staff. Uh, I really like how we've played defense. Uh, we've put a lot of effort, obviously, into recruiting more pitching talent and effort in developing the defense. Um, I would probably say uh, the pitching and defense is ahead of the offense at this point. Um, that's but, normal, uh, right? That's usually about – that's kind of normal in this stage of the, the season, you would think? 
It is. If, if you have a chance to have a good team, that's the way it should yeah. be. If, if your hitters are destroying your own pitching, you're in trouble. Right. And, um, yeah, and so very happy uh, that that's the case. And then, um, yeah, just like the effort level, like the focus. Um, I think this team probably so far has done the best job of respecting what we need to do to get prepared. Like, I don't feel like they're, they're obviously excited for opening day, but we haven't been looking past the day in front of us. And th- that self-discipline is something we're going to need in the season. So that's a good sign. Coach, um, I'm glad you brought up the pitching staff. We all know if you've played the sport that the fall is a little different from, you know, the spring and obviously the spring season isn't actually here yet, but the, the feeling of it, of everything kind of should kind of feel a little different once you show up back from the fall break. Is there any of these young arms right now who time in and time out as they, you know, keep taking the mound that are kind of impressing you that are maybe I don't, I wouldn't say you didn't see it before, but they just seem like they've taken that leaps, leaps and bounds each time they go out there compared to where they were, they were in the fall. You know, I think that as a whole, the staff did a really good job of executing what they needed to do to be prepared to throw when they got back. And part of that is improvement based and part of it's just flat out arm conditioning based. And I think they all hit their marks there. I mean, as far as names um, of, of new pitchers, uh, I mean, everybody knows about Paul Skeens. He's not really young, but it's his first year at LSU. Uh, looks, he's really hard to deal with from an offensive standpoint. Uh, Thatcher Hurd, same thing. Uh, Chase Shores has been really, really impressive, but he's been impressive since the first outing in the fall. So I'm not really surprised by any of that. Uh, Christian Little's back and healthier than he was in the fall. So he's taken a step forward, which is great. Um, so of the new guys, those are the ones that come to mind. And then got some good improvement um, from four returning pitchers that we're real excited about as well. So uh, good start for the staff in this early spring here. You know, obviously outside of the pitching staff, because obviously I think, you know, last year going in, that was what everybody was like, oh, we need to start pitching, we need to start pitching. And the pitching staff now I feel like is maybe the strength of the team outside of, you know, the, the top guys that you have in the lineup, right? Jay Mitch asked about, have you seen uh, improvement from some of these young guys? My question is kind of similar, but it's around the whole team, right? When you're in the fall and you're a freshman and you're, or you're a young guy and you come in, you're getting adjusted to living on your own, school, baseball, competition. Then you go through Christmas break and you come back and you almost feel like you're almost like a sophomore now, right? You almost went through like a, a, a season, a half a season, and you come back. Have you seen these younger guys start to develop and get a little bit more comfortable in their own skin on the field, around the guys on the team? Yes, and that's just a credit to the leadership we have. I feel as good about the player leadership on this team at this point as I possibly could. And so, I mean, obviously we talk about Dylan all the time, as we should. He's done a terrific job, you know, showing the way for – a lot of the young position players and obviously they respect him because of the type of player he is they also respect how he goes about doing what he does and that's uh, a credit to him so it's helped those guys settle in a little bit better now there's a whole nother layer of that when the bullets start flying right. you know i mean to keep their poise on opening weekend when there's you know thousand eleven thousand people here like we're trying to do some things to help them do that um so that would be another layer of learning, going on the road for the first time. Like, you just can't know that until you actually do it. But as far as baseball improvement, absolutely. As far as maturity, absolutely. And the goal is to, like, get those guys as close to sophomores at some point this season as we possibly can. Because there's they're going to help. Like, I mean, I mentioned Chase Shores. I mean... He's, he's by far the most ready on the team to make a massive impact. But, you know, you look at Paxton Kling, Brady Neal, Jared Jones, uh, Gidry, Ethan Fry is at a really good uh, start to this thing. Like, they, they all can help. It's just, you know, getting adjusted to the biggest jump they're ever going to make in their career from one level to the next. You mentioned y'all are doing some things to help these guys with those, with that transition, you know, whether it be off the field or, 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 you know, whatever, what are some of those things that y'all are doing or implementing to be able to help them make that transition easier? 
Yeah, I think uh, the winter break coming out of the fall, like this is, they have a very clear picture of this is who you are as a player right now. This is what you need to improve. This is what we need you to do to help the team win and then give them the road to connect all of those things. The expectations are really, really clear. What happens is the game starts sometimes and always revert back to what they know to this point in time. So that's why I've always felt like making the ex- your expectations to the player really, really clear or important. I think they're starting to see what they can do, but connecting the mental and physical piece of this thing. Because right now, the most important thing is going to be for those guys to learn how to slow the game down. So we do a lot of mental work, really lock an approach, really locking in, you know, some of them do some, you know, visual visualization uh, to see themselves successful in these spots and really just try to get them under control because you can't control your performance until you control yourself. Right. So it's just oh, these guys build self-control and, and they'll get it, you know, just like you, the more they play here, the more comfortable they'll become. Coach, we got a couple of questions from you in the chat. This is not from me, <laughs> but I do, I do agree with what they're saying in terms of, how you've been able to manage yourself at press conferences. It feels like you've gotten very comfortable. You already were when you got here, but they wanted to say, and this is from, hold on, let me get the name. This is from Kirk Landrino. When did you become such an awesome speaker at the press conferences and how (laughs) easily was it for you to ingrain kind of yourself into the culture of LSU and how, like how easily were, I guess how much easier is it for you to be comfortable now after year one? (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's definitely better. And um, that's just me being honest is, uh, you know, I jumped into this thing with both feet, but, you know, building your program and building a program, th- there's steps you have to go through. Like, uh, there's a reason that no first year coach has ever won the national championship. I mean, we finished second um, at Arizona my first year. And that was something that has left a sour taste in my mouth because I would have been one of one. Um, but that first year, man, you have to build like, and, and we had good results last year. I'm proud of that team, but there's a building process that if you're outside the building, if you're outside the program that's taking place that you don't know about, but that's how I get peace of mind in doing my job is knowing we're doing the things necessary uh, to build the program. Um, as far as being here, I mean, I've loved it here since day one. I mean, the alums like you guys, the fans, uh, the school, like everything has been super supportive of what we're doing here. And, and they love their Tigers. And it, it makes it the best place in America to coach. As far as all the other stuff, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm just myself doing, doing our deal. And, um, you know, want to make all you guys super proud of not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And so... I don't even know really how to comment on that, but we, we love it here and, and there's nowhere else I'd rather be. So we're just going to kind of try to keep doing it better and better every, every year. Not even the Yankees. You said that not even the Yankees. Well, it's the Yankees of college. baseball. Nope. That's right. It is. But uh, we had Josh Jordan on hold the rope yesterday. where obviously Skip Bertman. I'm, I'm sure you've bended his ear a little bit, but he said that y'all for the scrimmage had more people at the scrimmages this weekend than he saw at Duke's opening day. Do you feel a little bit of that pressure at least with the with what you've done through the transfer portal, how you've built the team, and it feels like it's Omaha or bust at this point. Yeah, I, I get asked that a lot, and it's like I just have two answers. Like, I mean, people could say you suck and you're not getting good enough players, and right. that's that's not the bad, case. <laughs> that's battle for. Um, but like, hey man, like, there's two things going on. We're trying to build a program, so all of that is just validation that we have returning players that can have success and have had some success and we've improved the talent level. So that should show future players. We have a plan and we're executing our plan. So it helps recruiting. It helps build the program as far as like the expectations for the now and living up to them and all that stuff. Like I'm not worried about what anybody says or thinks like we're trying to run towards and start to fight with it. And that's how we're going to do it. I I use an analogy of, you know, SEC baseball is like a a, a burning house. Well, if you're going to save the house, you better get in there, get all the people out of it, get your hose out and start putting fires out right and left. And you can't do that with any fear or worry or any of that stuff. So, um, again, if you're inside the building, you know how the guys work, you know the plan that we have. 
the attention to detail of the staff. You just that's where you put your peace of mind. And baseball, the only thing you can really control is the preparation um, and your effort towards executing. And those are going to be supremely high. And if you do that with talented players, then you can play with peace of mind and not really worry about any of that external stuff. Coach, you know Lloyd kind of touched on it a little bit. Obviously, you you went to the portal. You brought in a an extremely talented team. Some may say the most talented team in the country. I'm one of those people. Obviously, expectations are always going to be here at LSU. Um, but throughout the fall and throughout the spring before the season starts, you know, guys start to get developed and they start to play. Have anybody start? Have they started to? I guess this will be a twofold question. Have you seen players start to separate themselves from some other guys and say, you know what, I'm gonna, you know, this guy's definitely a start outside of the. Dylan Cruz's and all those other guys, competition makes a team better. Have guys separated themselves or have they made the decision harder on you? And the second part of that question is, in baseball, numbers don't really tell you the whole story. Obviously, you can look at the lineup and you can see, oh, this guy's got, he's hitting 350, but you know it could be a soft 350. This guy's hitting 150, but he's hitting balls hard. What goes into the decisions on how to make, uh, like make your lineups and make your opening day roster? Right? Do you look into analytics? Do you look into, or do you just put it all together? It's a long question. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's media. Yeah, no, I, I, love, I, I mean, I, this is like one of my favorite parts about the job is like, first thing is there's definitely peace of mind. And you guys know this as players when you can say, hey, this is your role. Go do it. Yep. Like that, that. Oh, no. Oh, he's getting a phone call, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. That that's the case that I can do that. Like Dylan is playing all right. the time. Right. Trey is playing. <laughs> Tom White is playing. Jordan Thompson is playing. Like that's like we're we're it's ride or die with with those guys. And there's other guys on our team that are good enough that you could put them in that category. However, like there's more guys than spots, and I don't want to undermine all the talent that we have with those other guys and shut the door on what's possible. So you may see it a little different and it's not cause we're tinkering. It's not, we're trying to figure it out. Um, it's, we can use more guys than nine to put together the right team or recipe for that game that day. And then it might look a little different the next day. All of that decision making is very well thought out. I spend a lot of time on that. Um, I've had guys I've coached with that said nobody kills more trees than you because you got no everywhere on line up. What happened to the whiteboard? <laughs> yeah, it's right over here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really um, exciting to do that with this group of personnel. Now the question is, like, did, are guys starting to separate themselves? I'm starting to feel like I'm getting a little better idea of how to start it out in certain situations mm -hmm. with where the pitching staff's going, where certain guys may fit a sweet spot of they are going to do really well in this role against this type of pitcher with this type of pitcher pitching, you know, we may want a defender at a certain right, spot right. and how to use pinch hitters and all of that. I definitely have a lot more of a clear picture today after this last weekend than I did a week ago. And I expect that to be even better next week. And what I'll do is next Sunday night and Monday, I'll meet with every player on the team and just like, hey, this is where we're at today of how we're going to start out. And these are the things that you need to be prepared for. And there's a little more ambiguity with that with this team than maybe past teams just because there's more than one guy that can get the job done at most spots. And that's a good thing for us. So, Coach, I mean, with so much depth on the roster, pitching-wise and position player-wise, mm -hmm. and honestly, with today's day and age with the portal and all, how is it that you manage the, the expectations of young guys and or incoming first-year guys about their playing time or playing situation as things are starting to unfold right now? Good question. First off, before I answer that, congratulations on getting married. Hey, hey there we go. Hey. <laughs> Hey, hey. There's, there's probably parts broken all over. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. No, man, I put my jersey in the rafters a while back. Now. It's been over for a while. <laughs> there you go. Except there for the rest go. of us. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Though. <laughs> uh, no, no problem. Um, you know, I think the simple answer is just communicating, number one. Like I said, I'll have a meeting with every player. 
I think number two, what we really tried to identify is what does this team need to do to be successful? We really believe we need to have a strong mindset. That means three or four different things. We really are hammering home the concept of being selfless. And what I did is I looked back at the national championship teams at LSU. Like there's really good examples of guys being selfless and accepting and embracing their role on those teams that propelled, you know, and your guys' team to to the top. And so if it was good or okay for those teams to do, maybe that's something we need to emulate. And I think that so far so good. Now we're not into the season where a guy hasn't played for six games in a row or pitched for 10 games in a row. And you don't know until that happens. But I do feel really good about the leadership. I feel good about their understanding of the things that we need to do to be successful. And and this concept of being selfless or placing the needs of the team above your individual needs is uh, really good right now. And I, I think that they get it and they understand it. And I also think that they know we have a plan for all of them, you know, and some guys like this is their time. Yeah. Some guys, it'll be their time you know, 15 games into the season. Some guys, it may be the end of the season. Some guys, it might be 2024, but uh, I like the roster and I like every player on the roster and they know we have a plan for them. We communicate that plan and they know how important it is to, you know, kind of give of themselves for this, this, this to work. And so we're really just trying to help them and communicate and educate them on that. And so far, so good. So as, as far as for you, like, with it being 11 days away, do you mm. do anything different? Do you approach things in any, like in any kind of way different? Do you format maybe the practices different? Is there anything that you do different from a coaching standpoint to prepare these guys for what's about to come as opposed to the fall and or when they first show up back in the spring? Now we're kind of down to the time where the season's literally right upon us. Is there anything that you do different in this time? Yeah, I think until Sunday, until this next Sunday, it's like, quote unquote, spring training. Like we have stuff we got to do to get ready. Like we, we can't let off the gas pedal just yet at this point in time. So it's longer practice days, those types of things. We have to get stuff, you know, put in. We get exposed every scrimmage and, you know, like really <laughs> turn the hammer out. Uh, it, yeah, seriously. Like you're not I, a hitting not guy mean, at all. I can't tell at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't leave the park super happy yesterday. I'm just gonna, <laughs> so today was West Johnson's was really in trouble special. already. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the best. Hey, well, let me talk about that. Like one part of me is ticked off at, right. at the, it's giving away some of bats. The other part of me is like skipping out of the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Nine dudes deep of guys that look like they're going to pitch in the big leagues. Someday. And so, um, trust me, I'll, I'll take this all day, every day. But, like, we got after it today. So there's always stuff coming up that gets exposed that you have to go back to work on. So we're still, like, way in the meat of, of that. Uh, I think, you know, I really try to manage the workload versus, you know, where does the mental break need to happen so that we can be ready on game day. I mean, this weekend, we're going to simulate next weekend. Like, we're playing nine innings each day at the exact time that we're going to play next weekend series. And so they get used to kind of that internal clock, so we're more prepared. Then next week, you know, a Wednesday practice will look probably similar throughout the year. Thursday, same type of thing. And try to get a a rhythm uh, so they can get – comfortable understanding what the preparation is going to look like. Um, but we're, we're kind of still full speed ahead as far as training right now. So we'll, 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 we'll shift probably a little bit next week. And you mentioned earlier in this conversation that you don't, you don't want to say the word tinker, but we saw what happened last year. There's a lot of times from wherever you kind of, I don't want to say micromanage, but you went up and tried to help your offense a little bit. How do you kind of, I guess manage this lineup when you have so many good players on this team. Do you feel like you? It's not going to be the same week one as it will be in you know month three. So how do you kind of how are you approaching that? And and do you feel like you everybody has their roles defined at this point, or is it going to be a kind of week by week basis? 
Yeah, I think you're right in that it's not going to look the same. You know, it's not going to look the same game two to game one, to right. be honest right. with you. I mean, it, it could be a different type of pitcher that we're facing. It's going to be a day game versus a night game. All this stuff plays into it. You know, I mentioned, you know, four players that are probably – they're they're going you know what i mean yeah. like they're they're and then you know there's a number of other guys that can make a, a contribution and so it's just like pitching like what we had to do last year is we had to find the sweet spot for that pitcher to be able to maximize their contribution it's like that with the position players this year you know defense over offense you know at, at certain spots um offense over defense at certain spots um you know, this guy handles this type of pitcher well. This guy handles coming off the bench maybe a little bit better. And then you're going to see us use guys a lot. You're going to see games that we win that aren't outlandish scores where 14 or 15 guys get in the game. And um, I'm excited about that. Right. And I think uh, by doing that, it's going to kind of show us where guys should go. And I think, you know, pitching and defending at a high level will give us the, the flexibility to work through some of that. So the only reason I don't like the word tinker is because it's there's thought put into what yeah, we're doing. We're not right. just hey, throwing it against the wall and right. trying to see if it works. Right. You know? Coach, I appreciate all of your time. Just a couple more questions. The SEC, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it and you know about it, but you probably know about it for a while. But the SEC came out today and said they're going to implement a 10-run mercy rule in conference play this year. I was just curious on your thoughts. I have my own thoughts about the situation. Um, what are your thoughts? I know off air we talked about, I think it's gonna, it takes away some at bats from some of the younger guys in, in those types of games. Uh, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, I, I don't love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just because, I mean, I wanna play. And right. yeah, I mean, if 10 at any school in the conference and there's, I'm telling you, like, I'm really excited about this year, but there's some really good young players yep. here that may not be at the forefront of this thing, but that are going to be really, really good. Like, there's some answers to replacing guys as they leave us that are right here, right now, and you love getting those guys in as much as you can. Right. So Yeah, we spoke I, about that I, in your office too, right? Like, when I was a freshman, that's kind of how I got some experience early on because we were beating teams by 10, 11, 12 runs, and I was getting at bats that I didn't, wasn't going to get if we we're in close games. And I feel like you probably feel the same way. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, I'm, of course I'm the coach, but we're going to have to take a lot better at bats to beat anybody by 10 right now. Than we... <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, just, I want to get guys in. Yeah, like, of that's, course. That's the and, and uh, you know, I'm sitting here talking about building team. And one of my roles in that is when I have an opportunity to do that, to get that yeah. going. And I take a lot of pride in that. We actually did it last year. We had some, you know, separating scores and we're able to get some guys in the game. And, you know, I hope that that's something that gets revisited, but I can't do anything about it. So right. I really don't think about it a whole yep. lot. Is what it is. Coach, I appreciate your time. We're looking forward to the season. We're looking forward to being out there. This is going to be my first year where I'm going to feel like I'm an actual season ticket holder. I'm going to get to go as many games as I can. So, uh, good luck. Nice. Looking forward to the next uh, week and a half until uh, next Friday, and I'm sure you'll see me in the box over here in the next couple days. Come watch some scrimmages. The He'll be oh. in a suite. No, you, there's no, 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 no suites aren't open for the scrimmages, Lloyd. We'll, we'll try to get in there for the scrimmages. We'll try to get in there for the scrimmages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Coach, I appreciate Sounds it, man. Good. Yeah, enjoy your night. All right, All right guys. All right. Great team. Thank nice you. See. Tough on the offense, boys. <laughs> He's not pleased. I mean, I mean it, listen, is he not a hitting guy at, at that heart is or the, what? That is literally the catch twenty catch twenty two, right? On as a head coach, like, okay, I'm mad because our hitters got they struck out ten times and they didn't score any runs and they get any hits, but our pitching staff looked great. So it's like, how do you manage that? And look, there's gonna be some days it's where very, the hitters win, some days where the pitchers. I say it's very hard to manage that, but like you said, man, like I've been around baseball long enough. You've been around baseball long enough. If we or you are smashing your pitching staff at this point of the year, it's probably not a very good outlook for your pitching staff. And let's be honest, at the end of the day, if they keep, if we can't stop them from scoring, we probably won't beat them. Yep. It's just kind of how it goes day in and day out. Yep. Right? So, like, 
I get it. I know what this offense has. And I, I think for me, that's probably the more exciting part. And I would imagine for him, that's also probably the more frustrating part is with well, this talented group of hitters is getting dominated right now. He's happy, but he's so mad because he knows what they're capable of. But I think he also, at the end of the day, when he probably finally lays his head down and turns the cap off, I think he has a good idea how good that staff is. I right wanted now. to ask him about Riley, Riley Cooper throwing the knuckleball. I forgot to ask him. Oh, oh yeah. I thought that was for sure going to come we'll out. We'll get West on. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk. We'll talk about that. I'm looking at the pitching staff right now. Like I'm looking at the guys they have and kind of the numbers that they've put up. Obviously, Skeens, he's he's going to be their Friday night guy. He's announced that, right? He talked about Shores a lot. Shores has been up to 99, 100. Like so, you have two guys on your team that are going to hit 100 this year. Chase Shores is going to hit 100. If he's throwing 99 right now with nobody in the stands, he's hitting 100. I, I can't wait to see what his actual role is. Like, yeah, no, that's, that was going to be my next point. I can't wait to see where he's going That was going to be my next point. He said he's the most ready right now you as a freshman. You can tell he's like oozing to get him on the mound. But how and where is he going to And I know he had, mentioned, he had mentioned before that he thought Grant Taylor, he was going to maybe put Grant Taylor in that closer, hey, I got to have it roll, 7, 8, 9, game's in the balance, boom, you're in. But does he treat Chase Shores like – Vanderbilt treated Sonny Gray or Carson Fulmer. Maybe he throws Chase Shores in that eighth inning. That eighth inning that's role. what I mean. Like, hey, Sonny, Sonny Gray closed his freshman year, mm -hmm. throwing 100 as a closer, won the one inning guy, and then became the starter so sophomore junior year. Does he do that or does he say, okay, I'm going to put you in the rotation and so on Sunday and I'm going to keep Grant Taylor as his guy? Because I'm looking at Grant Taylor's numbers, right? Grant Taylor has the most strikeouts on the team hey. out of any pitcher. He's thrown seven innings, struck out 16. So that's over two an inning. I know you aren't good in math, but that's over two strikeouts an inning. Skeens has eight innings pitched, 14 strikeouts, right? Which is close. impressive. Too it's less. close, right? Two less, right? So my point is you have guys who are power pitchers who can strike guys out. But if Grant Taylor is doing that in, seven, in the innings that he's pitching, like, do you want him to be on the mound as much as you can? Or do you say, screw it, he's going to be the closer? I think of it this way. And... <laughs> If we can sit here, like we, I think back to my last year. Floyd's here. 97 up to right. 97. I saw that. I think back to my last year here, and we had, and this is no disrespect to anyone else that was on the staff, but we had three dominant guys, like legit dominant guys, right? We had two first rounders, we had two and a starters, third and we had a closer that was dominant at the time, right? And our Sunday guy was a third rounder. And our Sunday guy was a third rounder who was probably this far from making it to the big leagues, yeah. right? With that being said, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, all right, so we're sitting here talking about Chase Shores and Grant Taylor at the back end of the bullpen. Two guys that, if I'm being completely honest, run numbers up there, not like we had one guy doing that at that point when, when I was here. Right. Right? And you got two that are possibly at the back end of this bullpen, and we're not even talking about the guys that's going to actually give – that's going to be giving them the ball, the guys that might be bridging to them as well. Right. Like that – this team is so deep, it's not even funny. To think, to think if health health wise and performance wise that you legit don't have to go to like a, a Grant Taylor and or a Chase Shores until the ninth. Like we don't we don't we're not asking you to go out there and give us three. We're not asking you to go out there and give us six outs too. Like to think that you really might not have to do that until the ninth is crazy in college baseball. Uh -huh. It's crazy. I'm looking at the rotation, right? So let's just go with guys who could be in the rotation as far as. Guy like pe pitchers Coop that ninety one, huh? I said Coop's hitting ninety one. Yeah, like as far as Jay, and this is like this isn't this what isn't, they've been throwing is, all right, right, right. Like right. this is like this must be from the fastest pitch, the hardest pitch they've seen. Because Skeens was almost at a hundred in the fall. You know, what I mean, he had ninety nine point eight in the fall. Right, that's probably more like an average thing, honestly. Right. So you look at the guys that Jay has mentioned on the staff. Paul Skeens, obviously Friday night guy. He's mentioned Chase Shore a lot. He talked about today. He's as out of all the guys, young guys, he's probably the most ready. He talked about Thatcher Hurd coming over from UCLA. He would you would imagine he's going to be in the rotation. He's touching 95, 96. He's got 11 strikeouts in seven innings right now in the spring, and so you'd imagine those three guys would be in contention. Ty Floyd, 97, he'd be in contention for a rotation spot, right? You also have Blake Money, who's has the experience. He's been there. I don't know if he's fighting for that rotation, but you have four guys right there, and you're not even, not even talking about Christian Little, who oh. is a projected supplemental I, second rounder. So something tells me he's going to be probably more in that bridge role just because of what he just said today, and he's all he said it was just one word he used. It's getting healthier. 
So it doesn't right. sound like he's all the way there, which is scary because he's sitting mid nineties and he's not all the way healthy. All the way yet. healthy, and he's not all the way there yet. But it sounds like he's going to at least out the gate, seemingly kind of be in that bridge role. Which once again, like if you got an arm like that, that's bridging. That's crazy, man. Like you don't see that in college baseball. And they're in such a different spot than they were last year in terms of like the pitching. Like oh, yeah. they had to throw Coop out there. Oh, he's like, oh, he was a band aid for yeah. just please fix it. Like go get outs for us. I mean, you saw it catch up to him in the regional. I think, and now they have they like well, they, you said well, I, deep. I think what, what you're seeing now with with that staff that they have, if they can stay healthy, you're going to see them win a lot of one run low scoring ball games on Friday and Saturday nights in the league because of what you you know what you're going to face on the other side. Right. But they have the arms right now to kind of deaden the opposing offenses right now, and it's that is how you end up being very good teams, and that's how you end up having a very high win total and going forward. And I think what people forget about, and I keep going back to 09 only because that was the last championship team, right? Which not just wild. Not just because we played on that team, but obviously we played, so I have a firsthand, we have a firsthand right. experience right. on the dynamic of the team and the guys who were on the team and how it was set up. I think this team this year has more depth than we had all around as far as guys on the mound and line up deeper on the bench. Now, you're not going to be able to use everybody, right? That's just the way baseball is. But what we had, and I think what people overlook a little bit, is off the bench we had four guys who were seniors or fifth-year seniors that have had roles on the team as starters. Nick Ponov had was a starter at one point. Chris McGee had four years and a lot of experience on the on the playing field. Like he's done a lot, played and a, a lot, lot of different, different positions, positions too. right? Yeah. Buzzy Heidel, same way. Yeah. And you have these guys who are in the dugout. and Chad they, Jones shows up. They embrace their role. I guess what he's talking about is selflessness and embracing your role. They embrace their role. Now, as a freshman, they may not have been that way. And over time, they've kind of seen how it was supposed to be built, and they, they embraced it. And those guys were some of the – that was probably one of, some of the biggest reasons why we won these games, right? High energy in the dugout, in the locker room, clubhouse. Everybody was like, oh, glue guys, glue guys, and like – some people take that as like an insult. I think those are necessary. And so I'm looking at our, our roster, right? I'm looking at the lineup, and you have a lineup that's full of talent, but you also have a lineup full of veteran guys, right? Gavin Duga is coming off eye surgery. He's going to be there for his, I think it's his fourth or fifth year. I don't know if he's a fifth-year senior or not. Kay Beloso, fifth-year senior, coming back. Healthy. Right? Healthy. Like these guys are there. They've been there. They've had moments on in their career here yep. so don't underestimate these the veteran presence coming off the bench or starting right you have joe bear who had 18 homers like he's probably going to start opening day because of that right because he's the experienced guy he has the ability but he's not going to play every day he's coming off the bench uh, you have malazzo who he already talked about being a uh, we talked about it on the interview on friday that he had being another catching coach on the team so you have all these guys that pave the way for the new young guys to come in and either take their position or just um, help the team win. And to me, that's a big reason why I'm so confident in the guys they have on the team. I, uh, you know, the, the, another element to that is you talk about the older guys and I, I think about the younger guys. I think something else that's helped this group and what this team has got right now that's kind of organic is the sense of so you brought in a bunch of young, very talented players, right? And he, you know, he spoke about it just now. He alluded to it a little bit. I think the the older group of guys, the older group of transfers that that's come in, they've all come in and seemingly have been like as advertised. Yep. So it doesn't make that younger group in a way feel like bitter, if that makes any sense. Right. I don't think they look at themselves any less. I don't think they look at themselves as if they can't do it. But I think they understand the pecking order of it, right? And that's going to help in a sense of everybody pulling on the same end of the rope. When you see them doing it, you see the guys doing it the right way. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, I didn't play until the third week of SEC play, right? And the only reason I played was because Chad had to go play football and we sucked but once against it, Harvard but, in the middle but of the once week. again, you also knew at that time, I guess that's a perfect example, is you knew at that time, like, it wasn't a, I can't do it. It was a, well, he is in front of me. Yes. It just is what it is. And I got so I'm going to keep showing up. Absolutely. I'm going to keep working my, my, butt, my butt off. If an opportunity comes, 
I'll try to take the best the, the, the advantage of it. But like, I understand when I show up here, these guys have done whatever they're supposed to be, whatever, and they still looked apart. So, so it just is what it so is. I'm behind it. Tell us your baseball. Here's I'm what just it's behind it, to be. stuff, but that's what it's supposed to Here's be. Here's an example, right? And this is true story. Like, hand of God, true story. Coach tells me against Harvard that, hey, you're starting the second game of the two game midweek series against Harvard. He made a big to do in the locker room you know he made did the whole like coach Maneri, i'm gonna challenge everybody we played terrible i'm gonna play guys who want to play the whole deal so he tells me that i'm gonna play like in me if you know me i want i don't want to disappoint anyone like i want to i'm a perfectionist and i'm like okay i get this opportunity i gotta go out and do it i show up to the <laughs> i show up to the field that day at like 12 45 I get in the cage at like 115. <laughs> to pour yourself out. And I am fucking <laughs> banging balls in the cage. I'm dripping sweat. Schimpf walks in. Buzzy walks in. And they're joking. They're like loosey-goosey having this good time. And I'm like dripping sweat. And like I'm like I'm grinding over the tea do the whole out. deal. And Sean and, uh, and Schimpf's like, dude, what, what is your deal? Like, hey, relax. Take a deep breath. Like, you're fine. Just go get like you can do this like you you're good enough to do it so like let's let's stop putting so much pressure let's relax. Buzzy comes in he's like hey when you get to the like just relax dude you're fine we got your back basically just giving you words of encouragement and allowing me to calm down. I get to the my first at bat, opposite field homer, right first at bat. I'm like let's go, run around the bases do the whole deal. Next at bat home run over the Alex of the Alex Black Stadium like hammered it. So two home runs in my first start, and I'm like, oh my god! But like, and when I'm on the when I got to the when I got in the box, I thought, all right, deep breath, calm down, like, and basically everything that they had told me in the cages, right? And it it goes a long way just to see them do it and hear them talk about it. And so when you get ready for that opportunity, it helps. And like that is to me very important to build a winning team. And you know that's that's why older guys and veteran guys on teams are so important. If you if you go back to speaking about 09, I think that was one thing that is widely overlooked. Like we had a lot of talent on that team, but I I firmly 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 believe from top to bottom of that roster, everyone was pulling on the same end of the rope. Yep. I, like I completely firmly believe that. I'm not in that clubhouse every day with those guys, but from the people that I've talked to, the people that we've had here, how they were last year, how Jay is going about doing this thing, it really seems like these guys are all on the same end of the rope. And that's really hard to do with a very talented team. But when you can do it is when you do special things. And it seems like they have the makeup and the situation to be able to position themselves to do something special. And we've been, I mean, we've been talking about this off air for, a, I, I think, like the past two shows. From the, the LSU bar still put out that video of the 2009 where it takes, I mean, obviously y'all were supremely talented. You were supposed to win the national championship. And you were one swing away we're from- We one what, pitch away from losing game one and having a very tough battle. To, yep. I'm not saying we would have lost the whole thing, but the way young men threw the second game, first rounder, 14th overall, 15th overall pick in the Good draft- luck. Good luck. He was lights out that day. Four, four. They beat us four to one, and we didn't sniff, sniff. He was lights out that day. Yeah. So like, you if you lose that first game, you face their ace, their fifteenth overall pick in the draft in two thousand eleven draft. You face him. Yep. Game two for everything. Like that's tough. And then you start feeling. That's when pressure happens. That's when you pressure. start. You kind of change your mentality a little bit whenever you might not play the same way that you want to play. But that I guess my greater point was like that's how hard it is to win this thing. So. The expectation on LSU baseball right now is, I would imagine, obviously they're the betting favorite on Caesar Sportsbook. Like you can grab them at still like and get them at plus five hundred if you want to get a little shekel. But I'm just saying, it's still it's not. You saw what Tennessee did last year when they win. What? How many games did they win last year? Fifty something. They lost like eight or nine games for the year, and then don't even make it to Omaha. Hey, coach, I'm gonna say this too because we hadn't really talked about them. That was the first time I heard him bring him up. And I absolutely love the fact that he brought him up as one of those four that 
rain, snow, sleet, or fall, he's out there every day because he was highly questioned last year. Yeah, and, and we people didn't are find still out. questioning him. And it, no, 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 they, exactly. And we're gonna. And they, we didn't find out until after the year that there was a knee procedure that had a lot to do with his quote unquote struggles, right? And people are probably still questioning him right now because they haven't seen it in, a, in like a real, real game with another you know stat line and all that. I, I, I really firmly believe that Jordan Thompson's going to have a great year. I Me do. Too. I think he, truly, I, truly, truly do. You kind of saw it at the end of the year. Truly do. I do. 100% you did. But it, at that point, in a way, it kind of all rolls into the numbers that you've already put up, right? So it kind of gets hidden. You know, that's just like we know, like if a guy hits, I don't know, 220 the first 30 games of the year, and then all of a sudden he has a hot streak at the end of the year, you forget, and that, that only hot streak only brings him up to 301, you forget what he did over that hot streak, right? Right. You only think about, well, I mean, he just hit 301. It was a pretty good year as opposed to being like, man, well, he was hitting 375 over that time. Right. Something like that. You know what I mean? Yep. So, like, thought process like that, I, I firmly believe you're going to see Jordan Thompson have a great season this year. I agree. I, I agree, agree, too. Because, I, yeah, I think they underplayed the injury, and now he's – yeah, Underhill is in here. We're going to get to a break. Um, I should pull up the picture. But I agree 100% with what you're saying because I think he got – he caught a lot of shit last he did, year, he and, did. and the way that he battled he back showed what. Kind and of nobody, we he didn't, is. nobody knew what he was going through until after the year, right? And then you kind of understood it if you get it, but I, yeah, I, I think this will be a huge year for him. I agree, I, and we need to get him on the show because he deserves to be able to yeah. talk about what happened and how he yeah. got through it and all this kind of stuff. But we're gonna take a thirty second break. Nick Underhill is in uh, the, I don't want to say the chat. He's in the on deck circle. He's ready to come on the show talk about Saints. They're making a lot of moves. People are questioning it. We're going to get all the answers from him. Uh, NewOrleans.Football, he is the founder of that. If you don't know, if you haven't subscribed to it, please subscribe to it. They have literally the best inf Saints information that you can get on there. I'm a subscriber. I look at it all the time. I read that stuff all the day, all, every day. 30-second um, break. We'll get back to Nick Underhill uh, after the break. Today's show is brought to you by Dos Equis. Here in Louisiana, we like to have a great time. If you're looking to be the life of the tailgate, check out Dos Equis Mini Kegs. Hold 16 beers, easy to tap, easy to pour, easy to chill. Check it out. Become a life of the party. You're welcome. Our What's for Lunch segment is brought to you by Doe's Eat Place. Maybe the best burger in town. If you're not looking for lunch, you're looking for dinner, go check out Doe's Eat Place. They have unbelievable choice of meats. They have unbelievable tamales. They have a great atmosphere, great vibes. If you're looking for a homey Louisiana type of atmosphere, but you're looking for high quality food, Doe's Eat Place is your spot. Go in the back bar, sit at the bar, have a couple drinks, watch some games, enjoy the atmosphere, enjoy the vibes. Check out Doe's Eat Place, the best place in Baton Rouge to get your meats. Yeah, I got you. You got me. Welcome back to Mic'd Up. I'm excited to have this next conversation with our next guest, Nick Underhill. Nick Underhill is the founder of New Orleans Football. If you haven't subscribed to it, said this before the break, please do. It has any questions, anything you want to know about New Orleans Saints. It is on there. They do a very good job. They go in depth. They get a lot of the um, behind the scenes stuff that you don't get with normal articles. Um, if you haven't checked it out, please go check it out. Nick, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Obviously, New Orleans Saints have been the topic of discussion around the NFL for a long time. Sean Payton, new coaches, all this kind of stuff. So uh, I'm excited to get some of the answers. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. So let's jump right to it. Um, Saints expected, or not expected, Saints hire a new defensive coordinator in Joe Woods. Joe Woods was recently fired from the Cleveland Browns. I know that some people aren't very happy with this, with this hire. What are you hearing? What went into this hire? And do you like it? I, I, I think you could have probably just stopped there. People aren't very happy and just kind of <laughs> yeah. left it there. Like people yeah. aren't <laughs> very happy with anything the Saints do these yeah. days. But, look, I, I think the one thing that with this one is that – Look, he got fired in Cleveland. It was a mess in Cleveland. I, I think things were a little bit of a disaster there last year. Their defense started off. They were they were awful. They kind of got a little more venom late in the season. But the thing is, is like, yeah, like a lot of the stuff they were doing didn't look good in 
there was a lot of busted coverages and the defense wasn't very organized early in the season. But, like, he's not coming here to run his scheme. Like, right. he's just going to be the top assistant to Dan Allen. So it's kind of like if you look at the configuration before, like, uh, on the offensive side of the ball, Pete Carmichael was Sean Payton's support system, basically, in, in the top assistant. But it was Sean's offense, Sean's scheme, Sean called the plays. Everything that happened was kind of, you know, the, the buck stop with, with Payton. And I think that's going to basically be the, the setup here. It, it's still going to be Dennis Allen's scheme. He's going to call all the plays. And I actually think that this setup is, is actually going to allow him to kind of take a little bit more control of the defense. And I, I think they needed that last year. And look, I know they finished top 10 in, in points and yards, but I think we could all kind of agree that for like the first half of the season, I think there was probably like a point in November even, like where it just didn't look like the defense no. was performing up to where they needed to be. And they still weren't getting turnovers. They had 14 turnovers last year. They didn't sack the quarterback at all. Like I, I think that kind of where they finished was – a little bit, uh, it, it kind of covered up some of the, the issues that they had. So I think there is room for them to get better. But here's the thing, though. Like, anything Dennis Allen does now, like, it has to lead to improved results. Because if it doesn't, they aren't just changing defensive coordinators. They're changing head coaches. They're changing everything. Everybody's out of here. And they have to get better. They can't They can't be a team that's, that's stuck in purgatory or gets worse. So he's going to kind of live or die with, with some of these decisions. But, um, you know, they, they, don't, they don't deserve the benefit of the doubt. But if you were going to give them like just like a, a little bit of it, it would be on the defensive side of the ball. The offensive side of the ball, there, there's no currency there. You know, I think overall with the whole program, they need to prove that that they know what they're doing. I don't think there's really any confidence in them yet, and yep. there shouldn't be. They finished seven and ten, and it was kind of a, a soft seven and ten. It was a late momentum seven and ten. Like they lived for like you know seventy five percent of the, the season is it, something that looked like a three or four win team. So. You know, they got there in the end, but it, it wasn't it wasn't convincing. So they need to find a way to be better and find a way to be convincing. And, you know, I think there's maybe a little bit of like, okay, it's good they're resting on their laurels on, on defense, but they, they got to get better all the way around. No, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the offense. I'm glad you mentioned Pete Carmack because I think people went into this, this past season very optimistic about, oh, you know, like he's been under Sean for this long. He's going to be able to implement – you know, the same stuff is we're not going to miss a beat. Well, that was not the case, obviously. Everybody thought that he was going to be gone at the end of the year. Instead of him being gone, both defensive coordinators were gone. And now you keep the offense that was abysmal intact. Mm. Is this, and you mentioned, you mentioned Dennis Allen having, you know, if, if, the, if they don't show improvement, they're all gone. Do you mention, is, is this the last year? Like, is, is this a two-year thing and done? If he doesn't show improvement, Dennis Allen's gone? And two, do you think that the offense is, um, you know, are they going to bring anybody to help Pete Carmack? Or are they just going to roll with it and say, hey, listen, we trust that you're going to figure it out over a year, even though you didn't give us any any indication that you're going to be able to do that last year? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I might have overstated that. Look, if they're like a, a middle-of-the-pack team again, I think they probably survive right. depending on, on what it looks like. But if they get worse, like, I think he goes into the season and, and his seats, you know, it's not it's not – hot but there's like smoke coming out of it a little bit you know something smoldering under there you know i think that i think that there's there's pressure on them and there there should be and this isn't a team that should ever get complacent or anything like that and i think we started to even see it last year in the superdome with some of the crowds later in the season and just kind of the, the fan apathy like they have to win they, they need to win and part of their their business structure with just running this team is based on being able to restructure contracts and give out signing bonuses you need upfront money to do that so you need people in the stands you need to have you need to have positive cash flow to, to make sure you can operate the way you're, you're operating and there's no easy way out of that like the cap situation is what it is like you know every year they're gonna have to kind of find a way to this year it's it's what 30 60 million or something like that like yep. they got to clear that to 60 million to, to get under the cap next year if they're conservative it's probably going to be 40 or 50 like those are gross huge amounts of money so so they need that they got to be good they got to be competitive Offensively, I mean, they do got to get a tight ends coach. I, I think one of the things they need in that role, like whatever profile that, that guy is, he needs to be a little bit of a, of a head buster, sort of, you know, in the Dan Campbell mold a little bit. Because yeah. Pete Carmichael isn't, isn't an enforcer. He's kind of, he's just, you know, he's, he's a, a mild-mannered individual that isn't going to necessarily command a room or, or strike the fear of God in anybody. And I think I think they desperately need that on, on that side of the ball, someone that's going to, you know, tear people apart for yep. false starting them practice or, or having fumbles or things like that, which I, I don't think they had last year. The players often talk about it. Uh, you know, as far as bringing him back, I think what we kind of saw with this defensive coordinator change, 
It wasn't something that happened quickly, but when they when they decided to make the change, they knew where they were going right away. So that kind of tells me that that Dennis Allen was out there making calls, figuring out who was available, and and then he fired Richard and he and he makes a change to uh, Joe Woods. I think on offense, I you know I I would I strongly strongly believe that there were calls being made to see who was available out there, and I think that they they were unable to find someone yeah. that was definitely better than than uh, P. Carmichael. And look, I mean. There's 15 teams hiring an offensive coordinator right now, and if you, you're the Saints and you're calling someone up and you're a guy that's worthy of having options, and when you're hiring somebody, you want to hire somebody that's worthy of having options because it means they're, they're good at their job and, and they can maybe go a couple different places. What are you selling them on? Like, oh, hey, come come work with Andy Dalton. Like, right. that, that, that was my next, and, and, that was gonna yeah. be my next question. So it's it's like, tough. how do you get an offensive coordinator with no quarterback? You know what I mean? Like, like no quarterback for the future, no plan for the future. I know people are talking about Derek Carr. Right, like Derek Carr being the hot name of coming to New Orleans, like is that something that you would like to see, or you would you rather them say, hey, we have a tw- first round pick, let's go get something in the draft and have a placeholder? Yeah, I'd like to see it because I think at a certain point you have to get practical about what's actually available to you, and if that's something that's actually available, I think it's it's a move you make, and, and I don't think it's you, you get Derek Carr and oh, it's you know you're going to the Super Bowl, you get Derek Carr and you got a quarterback who's probably worse than 15 quarterbacks and better than 15 quarterbacks. Yeah. And, when that's available, it, and you know, you kind of, you kind of got to seriously consider taking it. I, I would take that option if it was there, because look, you can go into the draft and you can, you can, you know, people talk about tank and go get this guy or get a top pick. But like, what happens if you lose all these games on purpose? You destroy the culture of your team. You get rid of all your valuable players so that it, it builds towards losing. You get that top five pick and you draft Zach Wilson. Like, huh. what, what happens to your team then? And. You know, you look at the Jets and they've been chasing that quarterback situation for, you know, I don't know how long, 15, 20 years since Brett Favre retired. Who, who's the best quarterback in Jets history since Brett Favre retired? Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez. I mean, that's a pretty sad way to live life. <laughs> you, you if you're chasing things. So I, I think you kind of sometimes have to take what's in front of you. Derek Carr's in front of you. You can maybe win with it. Like, he'll win you some games. He'll lose you some games. Andy Dalton's never going to win you a game. Andy Dalton's going to help you get to a win when everybody else does everything that that's, you know, building toward a win. He'll, he'll win a 24 to nothing game. He'll, he'll do, you know, the things you need to do. But like in the fourth quarter, he gets rattled and he falls apart. And look, sometimes Derek Carr does too, but that's why he's like the 15th best quarterback in the league. You know, but in the, the right situation, Jared Goff can get you to a, to a Super Bowl. Jimmy Garoppolo can get you to a Super Bowl. So Matthew Stafford can get you to a Super Bowl. So you could get there with Derek Carr. I don't see any possible way you get there with Andy Dalton, but I mean, when you're when you're in quarterback hell and you got a you got a ticket in front of you, I think you you seriously seriously have to consider. Nick, with so so many familiar faces from Sean's time in New Orleans still in the building, uh, the inevitable was going to happen, right? He was going to take a job, which he has now. He's going somewhere with that struggled recently, but they have a lot of talent there and a really good defense. Do you think that's created? kind of the fight or flight and up the ante a little bit for the coaches in the Saints building still, knowing that, like he, like like the question was earlier, like this could be your last shot at it right now, especially if that guy goes out somewhere, even though it's a completely different situation and does better than you by the end of the year, this could be your last stop or your last chance here. Do you think that's up the ante a little bit for those coaches inside the building? I don't know, maybe a little bit. I mean, I'm sure there, there, there's some competitiveness there, and, and you know, I, I'm sure they want to they want to do better than Sean and not have Sean go out there and, and show him up or anything like that. You know, if he figures out how to save Russell Wilson, though, I mean, you, you you got a significant head start, and I think it's probably pretty possible that he does. I think Russell just kind of needs somebody so to give too. him a little bit. Of, I, I think they'll be know, a surprise team in the league next year. I, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. But look, I, I I thought he was a good player. I think he just needs to get to a good system. And he's going to listen to Sean. He needs someone to tell him, you know, shut up. You aren't as good as you think you are. you got to play in this offense. Get team like, three out of here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Look, Sean humbled Drew Brees in 2017 and got him to buy into this, like, version of the offense that was just incredibly condensed and basically said, like, Drew, you suck at throwing the ball down the <laughs> field. We're going to stop this before anybody notices that this is wrong with you. And Drew bought in and had some of the best seasons of his career. He was an MVP candidate in, in 18 until he got – or late in the season. So you just go tell Russ that, and then Russ is going to – he has to buy in. Drew bought in. You're, you're Russell Wilson. Like, you aren't as good as this dude. you got to buy in. So, look, I think Russ probably got humbled a little bit too as well. But, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that Annie's up everywhere. Like, the Saints suddenly exist in this place where, where optics kind of matter a little bit for, and, and, you know, for so long they, they didn't. They just kind of operated how they operated, and they could just, you know, tell you to shut the hell up because they're the Saints, and, and they're winning games, and they got Sean Payton, and they got Drew Brees, and they got this, you know, season ticket list that's miles long, and you can't get into the building. Like, there's nothing anybody could really say to them, but, like, at this this juncture now like that stuff matters and, and you need to, to sell the team or the, the fan base and everybody like kind of on a vision a little bit and you know very soon if they keep losing games like for the first time ever they're gonna have to figure out how to sell like single game tickets which yeah. is something they haven't had to do since since 2005 so if sean's out here killing it and you're limping along like that that's just gonna make people even more mad and you know this is this is the most frustrated that i've seen this fan base you know since i got here and I, it's justified they should feel that way and you know that that would add to it for sure. So yeah, I think I think you're definitely right to to, to think that there is like some level of, of you know importance on that topic. Where, I mean, what do you think the expectations are for next year? Where do you? What, there's no quick fix. Obviously, the the Saints were built to win. Now it felt like, and then you didn't get the quarterback play that you wanted from Jameis. You didn't get it obviously from Andy Dalton. You don't get Michael Thomas back. You get Alvin Kamara who's in and out the lineup. Like, what should fans almost expect going into next year? It, it, it's tough to say. I mean, we, we don't know who's playing quarterback yet. Like, once they, they figure that out. How do they know, fix think, it? Like, is I it think, Derek Carr? There, that, I guess you got Michael Thomas restructured. Do you see a trade happening? Well, I don't think they can trade Mike Thomas because the way that contract's worded, like, he, he gets, like, a $30 million bonus, like, right after the league year starts. So if they were trading them to another team, like, a team would have to pay that $30 million bonus or – or they'd have to somehow redo the contract very quickly before trading him. But then in that case, if you're going to do that, if you're Mike Thomas, like you'd probably rather be a free agent and be able to pick your team. And if you can get two people interested in how they're negotiating against one another, and you're getting a better deal probably. So I, I don't think he really has any type of trade value. I, I don't see him sticking around as is. Like there's also another $30 million bonus on top of that. So like he would get $60 million to be on the team next year. So all this is doing is, is so – Without like getting too deep into the weeds, like it's just it's just a, a mechanism to ensure he gets cut so that his cap number and in exchange he got a million dollars to lower his base salary so they can designate him a June first cut and cut him without carrying that money on the books until June first. So he he did the Saints a favor, got a million dollars back, and basically got it in writing that he's going to get cut or he's going to get an on, ungodly sum of money for one season of football, which isn't going to happen. So he's not going to be there, but. Look, they got a lot of stuff to figure out. They got to figure out how to get a, a quarterback. They got to figure out how to get another pass rusher. I don't see any scenario. I shouldn't put it like that, but like it, it would be tough to see Marcus Davenport back here. Peyton Turner at this point is, is, you know, I don't know if you label him anything, but like he's definitely an extreme disappointment in circling the the block on maybe being labeled a little bit of a, a bust. Like you haven't gotten anything out of him yet to this point. Uh, they need interior pass rusher. They need to. Uh, uh, defensive tackle that can stop the run like you're, you're talking about some high value positions but like the thing is is they figure out quarterback and free agency and you feel good about the answer like some of these other things become a little bit more more manageable but if you go into the draft meeting a pass rusher and the quarterback those are the the two highest value positions and how do you how do you answer both those you, you just don't have the assets to do it the free agent market is very weak on pass rushers and kind of where they're at as a team. You don't want to go out there spending on one of those guys. Anyhow, you, you, you got to overpay for sacks and they just aren't a team that's in a position to overpay for sacks. Like their, their reality isn't, isn't close enough for that to be worthwhile. So it, it depends if they get a quarterback, like it feels manageable. If they don't, you know, I think your, your expectations are seven, eight wins and you hope for the best in a really bad division. Well, that was my next point, right? I, I appreciate your time. Only a couple more questions. I know uh, you're very, very, very busy, but Mike, you talked about a weak division. Everybody's frustrated. I'm a Saints fan. Obviously, I'm a little frustrated. Everybody wants to see the product that we've grown accustomed to seeing, and you haven't seen it. With that said, they have pieces still in place that are still very playing at a very high level. That window's right? barely you open. Have, it is, but you still have guys there. You can you can fill some other pieces in there. And but the, I think the most important silver lining is the division is not very good right now. You have a lot of teams and a lot of in, in transition. So. You have the ability to go out there and say, oh, I'm going to go 9-8 and eight and maybe make the playoffs and continue to build it and not really fall off a cliff. Do you see that them thinking along those lines? Do you see them, there being some glimmer of hope in the fact that, hey, we're not in a very good division, like there's still a shot that they can make a run at at least just being competitive? Seahawks competitive. the thing. 
Yeah, they, they, that's how they see it for sure. They, 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 they view it as, as it's possible to win the NFC South, and either you're in the playoffs or you're not, and that's right. kind of the, the reality of it. And I don't think that they're that bleak to the point where it's right. where it's like the the blow it up tear it down thing. Like there are still some some pretty good young players on this team, some guys to build around. Your your previous core is getting older, and there it kind of feels like those guys are aging faster than. That you'd like, like Ramchak's knee, I think is a, is an issue, and I think it's going to become a bigger issue going forward. That's not something that's going to go away. Alvin kind of feels, you know, like, like he's a little bit older than he was, and, and they got to figure out a way to utilize him a little bit better than they have in the past. But you know, I I think that there's still some really good young players there, and you get a few guys, and, and I don't think it feels that far off. And yeah, the division is definitely something that adds to that. I mean, it allows you to look at things a little bit more optimistically than you would if they were in like the AFC West and. There's just juggernaut teams over there, but they're in the, the weak NFC and the weakest division within the NFC. So I think they're gonna they're gonna try to keep being competitive. I don't think that they're gonna go crazy with the cap and, and go all in unless there's a reason to do it. You know, if they if they get the right quarterback, maybe then they they you know start pushing their chips back in. But I think they're gonna try to be kind of reserved and make smart moves, get their cap a little bit back in order. We're still trying to win a, a pretty soft division and. You know, they, they got to take advantage of some of these young guys they have. I mean, there's there are, like I said, good players. Like Alante Taylor's a guy on the rise. Marshawn Lattimore's like 25. Like, he's still really young. Uh, Alave, Rashid Shaheed. Uh, you know, th- there's there's good, decent players on this team. Pete Werner uh, is part of that core. If they keep Kate Nellis, I think he's kind of part of it. Cesar Ruiz suddenly is, is a bright spot. Eric McCoy. Like, it's not completely barren yet. And, you know, Marcus May is, what, 29 too. I mean... So I mean, there's there's some guys that they can build around. They get a couple more players. They have a good draft. Like it's 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 not incredibly bleak. I don't think it's at the point, like I said, where you, where you blow it up. And I, I think that's fake. Anyhow, you know, I think that's a right. thing people say. And when you when you try to to be, a, I don't know if you can swear on here. I don't say swear, but you can, when you try to be a bad team, oh curse! Yeah, when you try to be a shitty team, you become a shitty team. There you go. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Like, like when your plan is to be shitty, like you, you, you often don't find a way out of that. Like you, you, you just sink. Like yep. the, the teams that, that try to do that just never get good. And there's a reason for that. Like when you're trying to be shitty, like your, your culture completely erodes and, and you need good culture. You need people that are bought in. But when players don't feel like winning is the goal and the front office isn't working towards winning, like that infects your locker room and, no and doubt. you just, you're, you become horrible. Like it's just not a real sustainable strategy. You have to keep trying to keep going. Yeah, I mean, look, look. The Eagles are the Eagles are a team that that just kept trying to be good, trying to be good, trying to be good. Then they got lucky with the quarterback, and now they're in the Super Bowl. Like yep. San Francisco is a team that just kept trying to be good, trying to be good, trying to be good, and then they acquire enough pieces to to kind of be quarterback agnostic. In in some ways, you can put anybody there, and they're competitive. So, yep. I mean, I, I think you just have to keep trying to build towards something and and hope it hits. Now, if you keep trying to build towards something and you become ass, it, you know, just through circumstance and you bought him out that's a little bit different but but like when you try to be that like that's what you are that defines you and, and it's really really hard to get out of that once you you just kind of let your foot off the gas no doubt nick i appreciate your time quick question before you go you don't have to go in super in depth with the draft coming up obviously the saints have uh more draft capital than they had before they got before they got rid of sean payton where do you see them going in the draft and uh do you think that um you know, they use their picks, or do you, I mean, historically, they usually package them and move up in the draft. Do you see them doing that again? Yeah, they're like the most impatient team in the <laughs> world, so I don't think there's any way that they that they make all these picks where they're at. I know Jeff Ireland would, would love for them to kind of sit still and just get more swings of the bat. That's kind of something that, that he's always said. But when, uh, you know, they're sitting around coming up with their plans, like it's always to be aggressive. It's always to go for something. So I, I think they're going to try to try to get up. But yeah, I mean, I think where they go, I, I think they're going to try to get the quarterback beforehand, and then hopefully, you know, it somehow you find a way to get some up on the defensive line because I, I don't think they can feel the competitive defensive line right now, and that, that's kind of a scary thought. Do you think the Saints got fleeced with the Sean Payton trade? Do you think they could have gotten more? Well, I mean, there was no market. There was really no market for him. Like, if this was, like, I think we all thought that there was going to be teams, like, recruiting him and competing with one another to get him, but how it played out is everybody passed – Denver went to Harbaugh. Harbaugh said no. Denver went to D'Amico Ryan's. D'Amico Ryan said no. They were forced to come back to Sean Payton. And so it was kind of like you you got you got a first round pick out of like a non existent market, a very soft market. Like it would have been better if they didn't send the pick back. But I think 
practically speaking, like that was probably the best they could do because nobody else, yeah. nobody else was, was trying to get them. And yeah. they got a, a first round pick for a piece of paper, tying a dude to a team that was never going to work for him again. Yep. I, I think the outcome could have been a lot worse. Yep. I agree. Nick, man, I appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of your night. Uh, hopefully as the draft gets closer and the Saints get through the draft, hopefully we can have you back on and, and talk about the Saints making some really good picks and seeing a lot more expectations and, and yeah. not doom and gloom. Hopefully Appreciate things will unfold a little bit better for yep. them than what it has so far. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, cool. everybody's just pissed off and angry all the time, and I'm so sick of opening Twitter and seeing people uh, just, it's just not <laughs> New, Orleans, <laughs> New Orleans wasn't created that way. New Orleans is happy. Everybody has a good time, and right now nobody's having a good time. Yeah, people forget about Aaron Brooks. I mean, I, Jesus Christ! Don't bring that now. How are you gonna bring that back into him before God? Trying to leave on a happy note. I mean, he was the, well, he was the happiest player hey, on the team. Respect him. This is Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Nick, uh, enjoy the rest of your night, man. I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, man. Thank right, you. Yep, you too. Oh man, a lot of doom and gloom. He's got a tough job right now. It's weird, man. They made a lot of splash moves last year, and now every move they seem to make right now is just like swing and miss. Seemingly. You can't judge any of it really until the season comes, but right. it, they ain't, they're not making anyone excited. Let's just put it like that. Not at all. Um, they're going to suck. The division sucks. That's the only positive thing. Just got to be the best of the division. Be the best version of yourself you can be. I agree. That was a good interview. I wish you had the video, but, you know, that was... Getting ready for having fun. Oh, he's a good-looking guy. I don't know why I didn't want to do the video. I don't think it was had anything to do with that. But um, <laughs> he just got a haircut too. That's who we. I talked to him at the barber shop. There you go. Um, great show, boys. We're gonna end it. We're gonna shut shut down a tad earlier today. What do you have? I told you what I had. I told you that we what we had. There's no reason to talk about this on the air. I have a prior engagement that I have. My friend is leaving town for a long, significant uh -huh. amount of time. And so I'm going to dinner with my friend before he leaves. Where are y'all going? Uh, I don't know, actually. I, it's not true. You don't have to say it on air. Then. I really, I, honestly, I forgot where well, we're going. Well, you asked him on air. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I just wanted to see if he would answer or not. I really did forget where we're going. I got to actually text Allie and see where we're going before we get here. Um, does but, he place? Huh? Does? Not does. Not Should does. Should be. We will be, we will, we will be going to does here soon to uh, film a little commercial. That'd be nice. Uh, all right, let's go through the seggies. We had a lot that we didn't get to, but we had two guests. Okay. You know? I just put good, you thing, good thing there's Wednesday to talk about. That's true. There's no, there's nothing that's going to overtake the conversation. We can still have the conversation on Wednesday. You know what I mean? Um, all right, let's get through the seggies. Speaking of dose. Speaking of dose. Mistake of the... Lloyd's mistake of the day. Brought to you by Dozy Place. Brought to you by Dozy Place. Hit us with it. A man that never eats a steak it doesn't feel like anymore. Tom Brady. Is this Tom? That's Tom. That's Tom. It doesn't look like him. Why? His face looks weird. That's, That's Tom. Tom. But I don't. I mean, I guess I, I will call it a mistake. I don't know. I, what, mean, I don't know. I mean, just, this man just seems like he's lost a little bit. Like he doesn't. Yeah, he's lost in whatever paradise he's in right now. I'd like he's to. Done, do I guess before. I haven't looked at the background. <laughs> Take a look yeah. at that background. I get lost there too. He's what done do you this mean? Before, like he, you know, she took him. Giselle had taken the other picture of him for the Brady brand. Like he's Tom doesn't have any shame in what he's doing. He's doing it, covered up. Coming soon. He wasn't your, covered up last time. Hey, coming yeah. soon to your local Fox uh, broadcast. 2024. Why did you say? He postponed it because of that picture. It wasn't because of that picture. That's not why he's not doing it. I think that. he's going through a midlife crisis. I, don't know. I think desperate. you want him to be going through a midlife that's crisis. Desperate. Uh, that's, that's what I think. Desperate. That's promoting his own brand that he's creating. That's art. That's in like all these. He doesn't ever wear a t-shirt. It's always just the underwear. Well, he has an underwear line. Or well, he, has he has a clothing, a clothing line, line. I know that like, has underwear on it. So, um, what do you want him to run around in a muscle shirt? And a, like, what do you what do you want him to do? I have no issue with that. An oversized tee with the underwear. <laughs> <laughs> like a, like a sorority girl. Like, what do you want him to do? <laughs> Bring back the Nike shorts. <laughs> I'm just saying, but man, Tom is just, this is aggressive. My man, he's promoting his brand. Man, he's trying to make some, and and I'm, I love that he is he packing. I heat? love that he tagged the well, two guys. Why who, are you asking that question? <laughs> I love that he tagged the two guys that you would expect to be in that type of picture. Yeah. Edelman and Gronk. Both those guys have definitely been in probably some underwear shoots before because they don't. Get, they're always didn't Gronk do the the, the body. Yes. Really? Yep. There you go. There you go. 
There you go. And Edelman's always there. Edelman would have loved to have done the ball. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why didn't ask me, man? No doubt. No doubt. But that's um, my mistake of the day. That was your mistake of the day. That's fine. It works. Um, all right. Let's go through curtain calls. It's brought to you by our friends at Assured Partners. Okay. Um, AKA me. <laughs> Nothing like sponsoring your own show. <laughs> Good thing I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> me with the big that's dog. So we have that's counterproductive, for. right? Me if with it goes the big dog way. next week. Maybe we get a bigger one from him. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Boys. Uh-uh. All right. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Anybody got curtain calls? I, I got one. My uh, my curtain call is, since we didn't touch on much basketball at all today, I want to give a curtain call for everyone who's probably been exhausted with and tired of dealing with, outside of this, the, the Dallas fan base, one Kyrie Irving. Good God. He's very good. That guy's a walking headline for everything outside of basketball. I've never seen anyone seemingly kind of self-jeopardize himself without ever getting in like trouble off the court it's unbelievable he, but he's very good at basketball but no 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 he's unbelievably stuff, good at is basketball. it worth the other stuff uh, that's what you have to stuff i think you don't was, know what you're gonna get when you get him either right i think he would have been all right if he would have been i mean the mavericks might be getting fleeced here yeah I everybody everybody, everybody who acquires it might every, be getting fleeced everybody because i think he's gonna sign with the lakers everyone besides cleveland has gotten fleeced by him. yeah <laughs> like, everybody everybody that saw the trade said that wasn't a good trade for Mavericks. well but then the bat uh the Nets said they wouldn't send him to the Lakers. They made the bigger offer, and they were like, we're not doing that to help the league. Right. And so the Mavs are going to get him for one year, and then Kyrie's probably going to – it is hard to predict what he's going to do. Yeah. It's very hard. He does hard think the world is flat, which I, I think respect. He's, I think he's gotten past that, right? Yeah, he's gotten past that. I think he, he said he was wrong about that, but he was hard on that for a while. A while. He wouldn't get off that of it. That Duke education. Ooh, he wouldn't get off of it. Um, what's your current call? Mine is uh, I've, which one do you want to take? The one you, take you don't one take. You want. Cam Thomas. Okay, there you go. Tying into the Kyrie thing, you saw that man can cook okay. if you let him on the court. He is a bona fide he old school. Smile, nothing funny. Scorer. He's a bucket. He's a bucket. He's a walking bucket. Quote? What? They asked him why he's never he never smiles. He goes, "Ain't nothing funny." Nothing funny. And then they caught him smiling on camera. Yeah, him you and, score forty four, you can smile. Yeah, I think. It, what do you have? Um, Hold on, hold on. I think he did what twenty. He had sixteen for twenty three, six rebounds, five assists, and did forty four. Po- he scored forty four points in twenty nine minutes. The man is a bucket. When he gets hot, he gets yep. hot. No doubt. So free my man will wade because that's the kind of talent he was bringing in. I'm sorry, no Matt doubt. McMahon. Maybe you can get that thing figured out. But no <laughs> I miss watching good LSU shots fired. Pew 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 pew. My curtain call <laughs> is uh, to AJ Green. There AJ Green announced his retirement. Great career. Unbelievable career, borderline Hall of Fame career. I think towards the borderline, that's, towards the end of the, his career, he kept the injuries. Seven, kinda, seven Hall, Pro Bowl seasons. Yeah. Hall of Famer or no? Seven Pro Bowl seasons. Borderline. I'm not saying he is. I'm saying I think seven, he is. seven Pro Bowl seasons, six 1,000 plus yard right. seasons out of his 11 years. I think. Borderline. I think. I wouldn't I think, be surprised would say, if he got in. I would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he got in. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get in. It's one of those type I don't of know seasons. If first ballot. But no, no, no. Win. It's one of those type of seasons that like. If you compare it like baseball wise, he would never get in. But he's been unbelievable. But like football wise, I could easily see him getting in. Also, one of the greatest high school highlight teams I've ever seen in my entire really? life. Really? I've never seen his high school highlight. Dude, he had two balls, one over the middle, right? Like in high school. And this is the last. It, it was. I, it stuck with me because it was so impressive. Over the middle, jumps on like a deep in route, jumps up, the guy takes his legs out. The next play on the highlight film is the exact same play, the exact same team, the exact same ball. Jumps up to go. The guy goes to take his legs out. He picks his legs up. The guy goes underneath it. He lands it to the house. Mm. I was like, damn. And it was just his his highlight film was pretty mm. impressive. But shout out to AJ Green. Unbelievable career. Did it the right way. Hey, watching never him. Complained. I'll never forget just watching him and Matt Stafford. Stafford's freshman year at Georgia, I was like, good God. Yeah. Boy, that's that different. That was a problem. They Boy, that's good. different. No doubt. <laughs> and um, think about who he played with. That's in the NFL. That's yeah. why I think he's a Hall of Famer. He made Andy, him. He's had, he had a great he had, career. He had Carson great Palmer, career. but then he had Andy Dalton forever. Right, but he had Andy Dalton when Andy Dalton's playing the best he's ever played. I, you know, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, great show today. Appreciate you all for tuning in and listening. The start of Jay Johnson Mondays for the rest of the year. Look forward to it. Tune in on Mondays, baby. I just like that he likes it. Uh, me too. Um, we'll be back again live in the studio. He was still studio. full uni too, by the way. I know. Well, he just must have just got off the show. He was still full uni. 6 to 8 p.m. on Pants Wednesday. We'll be back again live <laughs> Friday from studio from 1 to 3. Please like, subscribe. 
um, to our YouTube channel. And uh, we're, if you want to listen to us and not watch us, we're on all podcast networks. I just saw the highlight that you're talking Peace. about from AJ Green. That yeah. was nasty. Yep. All right. Yeah. Peace. Have a good Back night. Friday, Peace. one to three. That's what I just said. Got to get to Wednesday first, baby. Yep. One I know. Day just back time. three days a week, boys. All right. Appreciate y'all. All right. Later.